Unfortunately, having too many does where you hunt is a very, very bad thing. Now, it's a good thing if, you, if you're out just to take some, some meat and some venison. Um, then it becomes very easy because does are very easy to pattern. They do the same thing every day and their movements are short during daylights and they're not going to change unless you spook them. So very easy to capitalize on a doe movement. You know, the, the oldest doe in the neighborhood is even easier because she's very patternable. Yes, she'll pick you out when you draw, draw your bow back. She'll see your movement. She can be wary of that, but at the same time, you can count on her to do the same thing every single day for the majority of the season if the conditions of food and cover are the same the entire season. So very easy to hunt, does are, and if you want venison, perfect. You know, too many does is a really good thing. There are areas that have a hard time with does. I talk about easy to have too many does on private land. Public land, it's not. There's an overabundance of hunters. Doe tags are sometimes plentiful, especially when you shoot a doe with your bow. And so it seems like the population is pretty low on public land compared to uh, private land. Too many does can be a really, really bad thing. I'm going to talk about 10 reasons why. But first off, having too many does is a sign of bad things. It's a sign that your, your habitat could be poor, but certainly a sign of sloppy hunting tactics too. Bad habitat that's slated towards the wrong time of the year to attract deer. We talk about that summer doe factory. If you have lots of does in the summer, they're going to stay into the fall. That's just about a proven fact anywhere unless there's just no food or cover in the, in the fall. Then they might leave, but you're still going to have a percentage that stick around. So that's not necessarily a good thing either. That means your fall habitat's bad that they leave. But if they're during the summer and you have good fall habitat, decent fall habitat, they're going to be around, whether it's food or cover or both. And so it's not a really good thing, but bad habitat and certainly sloppy hunting efforts because... If you're hunting poorly, if you're hunting, you're spending too, too much time off the couch, you're hunting on poor days, you're accessing your land poor, you're hunting food sources too much, you're spooking deer, you're driving ATVs on the land during hunting season, off season doesn't really matter, but during hunting season, if you're driving ATVs on the land, then you're going to spook deer when you're doing all of those things. And does and fawns can tolerate a lot of human and hunter stress, mature bucks cannot. They're the least tolerant of the deer herd. Middle-aged bucks would be second, and then young bucks, does, fawns are all about equal. I find a lot of properties that have tons of habitat, tons of food plots, big size acres, and they can advance deer to a three or four year old age class. And then the neighbors a mile away are shooting them as five and six year olds because they simply grow out of the stress level that they required or lack of stress level that they require to advance to that year of four, five, six years old. And so they just move on. So you kept them safe until that time and then they just leave and someone else shoots them down the road because you have food located too much. You don't supply that depth of cover we talk about where there's enough cover for deer, so they just move on. Now there are some exceptions. In public land locations, if you find a big hotbed of a lot of deer, then you probably find that they're there because of high quality food that's nowhere else, high quality cover that's nowhere else, and possibly a lack of hunting pressure in that little corner of the woods that you found. So you can find some mature bucks mixed in them. That's a little bit different in that situation. Now there's also a situation I can think of with ag land where you have limited size parcels, 40, 50, 100 acres, 30, 20 acres, 150 acres, surrounded by hundreds of acres, if not thousands of acres back. Then you, you because of the lack of cover in the area, you're gonna pile a bunch of deer into one location. Those are the easiest parcels to manage because they suck all the deer in. And even if you have poor habitat and cover, they'll still be there because of a lack of cover in the area. So then you get to see what'll happen when you get to have a buck that's five, six years old. If he's in an area where there's 200 inch deer, you'll have some 200 inches pretty easy. If you have, and don't, and I wanna tell you something, I've been on client properties that have seen a 200 inch deer, at least one for 15 years straight, 12 years straight. There are properties like that around the country and they're not fenced in. It's not a pipe dream. There's a lot, a lot more areas like that than you think when like-minded people are getting together and allowing bucks to grow to five, six years old. They're not a one in a hundred thousand or whatever the stats are with bucks in certain areas. People see them all the time. But those are the two exceptions. You see public land spots. Sometimes there's these could be um, adjacent to um, government land, municipalities that don't allow hunting. All of a sudden you have a lot of deer there that are completely protected and you get some nice bucks in there. So there are some exceptions, but generally having too many does is a very bad thing. And I'll talk about this all the time. And I'll talk about 
number one, that too many does destroys your rut hunt. And there's a big reason why. But you have to have that balance. Again, I talk about as the number of does goes up, the number of bucks goes up to a certain point of balance. Once you pass that point, as does are going up and the population is going up, after you pass that point of balance, the number of bucks goes down proportionally. There's a lot of reasons for that we're going to discuss here, but that's something you have to understand. Not a, if you don't have does and fawns in your property, it shows that your land's not attractive, and that's not a good thing. It's not attractive for habitat, food, cover, whatever it might be, but there's no does and fawns. That's a really bad sign, of course. There's not going to be mature bucks there. So you have to, does and fawns are a sign that your habitat's to a certain level of quality, but you don't need too many does and fawns. It destroys your rut hunt. Look at it this way. Everyone says, yeah, but during the rut. Yeah, but during the rut. Folks, if your property is not good sometime in the early to middle October lull time, in through the end of the rut, into December, there's something going wrong, especially if you're spending a lot of dollars in your habitat and you're creating quality habitat and they're not holding. If you have too many does, they just take up space. So right, out, right away, you can take a small parcel, even 80 acres, 100 acres, let alone 40, 30, 20, 10. And if you put too many does and fawns on there, you have zero room left for mature bucks. They do not want to live on a daily basis during the daylight with mature does and fawns. They require a much higher level of reclusiveness and a much lower level of stress. It doesn't matter if it's people or herd stress, other deer. They don't want stress. I talk about my, in my Mature Buck Success by Design book, in the intro, I talk about, and I've shared this story a lot, but I talk about an old buck, leaves the area where does and fawns are young bucks in the morning. He's coming off a food source. He goes back to his little honey hole right at daybreak into a bedding area. He gets quieted down, relaxed. Stress level goes down. He's in a secure, safe location. All of a sudden, a couple young bucks come through. Middle-aged. He's five, couple two, three-year-olds come in. He stands up, bristles, postures. Those deer move on. He actually goes back a little bit further. Bother him. He wants to go to his happy spot. And later I talk about that was my dad. You know, he passed away in 2019. But I talk about my dad being that old buck where the older we saw him, he still wanted to interact with everybody. He still liked playing games. We had a great time with my dad. He loved to laugh. And then as he got older, he just didn't want to play as many games. He wanted to be in his happy spot. If we went out into the kitchen where his happy spot was down, he had a crossword puzzle on his leg, pretend like he was sleeping so we wouldn't bother him. He might move to the computer room. He might go for a drive in the car. The bottom line is, he was like that old buck. He wanted to just, and that's what happens. Does and fawns are social. They're hanging out together. The herd mentality, it's a lot different. So when it comes to rut, if you have too many does, right away, you're not going to have as many bucks focusing on your land during the daylight. If your property is a nocturnal property to mature bucks, they're not just going to all of a sudden come on your land. They already look, view your property as a nighttime parcel. That's not a good thing. That means they spend a very small percentage of the overall entire season on your land during daylight. Literally, it can be days, and that's it. So if you're expecting them all of a sudden, all these mature bucks to flock to your land after they avoid your land during the daylight the rest of the season, that's not going to happen. There's too many does and fawns on your land. They don't want to go there. The does and fawns are taking away your resources. A lot of times that's why people can't have enough food pots because there's too many does and fawns on the land. Let alone, why are they going to run, chase, seek, actually exhibit rutting behavior, fight for other deer, or fight for fight bucks for other does, when they can just pick up a doe anywhere. They don't have to move. So bottom line is, for a lot of reasons, if bucks aren't focusing on your land the rest of the season, they're not going to all of a sudden do so. You'll have a few on there, but you're going to be a fraction of the amount, the overall number of mature bucks that would have otherwise been there if you actually approach a balance of deer on your property. Number two, no reason for bucks to move. Again, during the rut, there's no reason for bucks to move if you have too many does. And where are they gonna live in the first place? They're already living outside your property because all the bedding areas are taken over by does and funds. They don't wanna be mixed in with those except for during the rut. Why are they all of a sudden going to come on your property? Number three, it's easy to have too many does on your land. You know how you do it? Plant a bunch of beans during the summertime. No, there's an exception where you know, northern locations, big woods in Kentucky, we're trying to build a herd. Then you need summer food to build a herd. Once a herd is built and you have good quality fall food, then you're reducing the summer food or eliminating it altogether. And now you have deer that are not wanting anything during the summertime. They already have that in the local habitat. But then you're slanting all your efforts towards the fall and winter so that you can get them through the fall and winter in great condition. Then you can actually grow and improve a herd. But in most areas, you put a lot of summer food on your property, you're going to have a lot of does and fawns called a doe factory. 
those does and fawns come back, those and fawns that are here today are here to stay. We see it hundreds of times over, seen it all over the country. It's not just a concept here in Southeast Minnesota, Southwest Wisconsin, the UP of Michigan, Southern Michigan, Pennsylvania, where I've been, where I've actually hunted many, many years. It's a concept everywhere. I see it all the time. One of the easiest things we can do for a client is teach them how to reduce their doe numbers and they're gonna have a better hunt the following year. And the first step of doe reduction is to actually eliminate the summer food source. Very easy, spend a lot of money on habitat. Drive your ATV through the property, hunt poorly. You'll have a lot of does on your property because mature bucks don't wanna be there, let alone middle-aged bucks. Hunt poorly, make a lot of noise, improve the habitat greatly, spend as much money as you can and you're gonna have a lot of does and fawns in your property, and you're not gonna be a herd influencer. You're not gonna have a great hunt. You're not even gonna be close to the potential you have, even though you brag about and like to show all the money you're spending and all the things you've done on your property. Some of the biggest habitat days that I've been to where people say, yeah, we're gonna have a habitat day on our land because we've done so much, we wanna show everybody are some of the worst deer herds and hunts that are produced because overhunted, driving ATVs, Lots of deer during the summertime, they're there to stay. And it gets to a point where you just don't have enough doe permits to go around. I encourage clients a lot to have a doe party where they're harvesting doe harvest. We have four days at the end of muzzleloader season in Wisconsin where it's doe only. Great time to take advantage. A lot of states have late doe hunts where you can take advantage if your does are excessive and you can have a party and do so. Invite, you know, invite a father, son, father, daughter from church and get them to come out to your land. Several fathers, sons, and daughters out and have a great time, have a great weekend. We're gonna focus on does only and go out and have a hunt, great hunt. That's a great way to reduce the numbers. Number four, does take up space. 40 acres, depending on your bedding, how thick it is, what kind of food you have, you might be able to have 10 does, 12 does and fawns, 20 does and fawns, whatever it is. It, it changes so much from north to south, big woods to good cover, quality hover. You can take an area that has bad habitat, change the habitat, and it'll support more deer. There's no set number per 40, per 100. If, if people are giving you set numbers per 40, 100 acres of deer that you should have run like the wind because it's very, very poor advice. I saw it down in Mississippi, had a client down there. They, they had a wildlife biologist come out and they saw 200 does and fawns in February and deer on the property in general. So that habitat, Wildlife biologists recommended they shoot 50 does and fawns every single year until they got their numbers under control. The only problem was those does and fawns were only there in February because they're eating browse. It was the only place of browse deer came from all around. They had good winter cover. And so those does and fawns, other deer were there during February. And that was several times more deer than they had during the fall. So they're looking at numbers the wrong way. After five, six years of shooting as many does as they had, they had a hard time seeing a deer. So very, very poor activity. But bottom line is they had a lot of space to grow. Let's say it was 400 acres. They had a lot of space that they could fit on their land and there's no set number. And you have to be very wary when you're looking at deer numbers of when you're seeing deer based on what you're going to shoot during the fall. The bottom line is, again, if you're not putting that summer food there in the first place, you shouldn't have a doe problem. That's what creates doe problems a lot of the time. Number five, it makes it really hard to hunt when you have a lot of does on your property because there's a lot more eyes, there are a lot more ears, there are a lot more noses. You have to fool many more deer in your area. And yeah, a doe might only run 100 yards, 200 yards and go to the other side when they slightly detect some. We have deer that does that'll stomp walk around in a circle till they get your scent. Mature bucks don't do that. They don't stomp their feet, wait around, walk around in a circle at 30 yards, giving you multiple shot opportunities, and then bugger out. They're gone. They're gone a lot of times when you make a squeak in your stand from 200 yards, they're gone. They get a, just a slight whiff of you, just your breath coming out your ear. They're gone, let alone if they see you move at all, they're gone. Does are not like that. We talked about that before. Like a fawn is a three cents animal. What I mean by that, Dylan and I talked about this, where a doe and a fawn, they want to see you, hear you, and smell you to take off. A lot of does, young bucks, they're two cents animals. It only takes two cents. They see you, hear you, they're gone. They smell you, hear you, they're gone. Just two cents and they're gone. A mature buck is a one cents animal. He smells you, hears you, or sees you just a little minuscule amount and he is gone. That's the difference between those deer. But more eyes, more noses, more ears, not a good thing when it comes to having too many does on your land 
because there's a lot more deer that'll detect you. Number six, it's a waste of resources. So what happens when resources are wasted? Those are eating you out of house and home. They're eating their cover, they're eating the food, they're eating your food plots, and you don't have any left around in late November, December, when you should be attracting more and more bucks to your land. Mature bucks should be moving on your land in October, November, December, not June, July, August. If they're moving on your land in June, July, August, horrible timing. You need to flip that around because they live in a completely different spot during the summer as they do in the fall. Not that there's not an overlap, but they're going to spend the majority of time in the fall, winter in their fall habitat, not their summer habitat. They might go back to their summer habitat 5, 10% of the time at night mostly, but they're not going to be there in the fall if you have a large supply during, during the summertime. The bottom line is if the does and fawns are eating you out of house and home, what do you have left for the mature box? The does and fawns, they'll stick around if, you, if they have poor quality food, poor quality cover. They'll, you, they'll let you push them around a little bit. Those mature bucks are absolutely gone. Number seven, why do bucks leave home in the first place? You're expecting bucks that left home as a yearling buck, meaning a year and a half, first set of antlers, that's about a year older than a fawn, difference between a yearling and, and, a, and a fawn. So a yearling buck leaves with his first set of antlers and they disperse. They disperse about an average of a mile and a half. When they disperse, they disperse because of female social pressure. They're kicked out of the herd by their mothers. If their mothers are around, they leave 90% of the time. If their mothers aren't around, they stay 70% of the time. So they leave because of female social pressure. The last thing they want to do, even a young buck, is find a property overrun by does. They're not going to stick on your land, folks, when there's a lot of does. They just left their home ground that they'd rather stay at 70% of the time because they've been kicked out due to female social pressure. When you have female social pressure on your land because you built a land or a parcel or you hunt an area with too many does, those young bucks don't want to be there, let alone those older bucks. That's stress. They want to be around does two weeks out of the year, but they can only breed three or four. That's another thing. They, these mature bucks are going to breed three to four does in the primary rut. That means one every three or four days. So they're not breeding a lot. It's not like more does mean they just breed more. That's not the way it works, folks. They can only breed. They only have time to breed. They have to tend that doe, breed her multiple times, find that doe, fight off other bucks. All bucks ages, all buck ages participate in the rut. And that's the problem. They can breed a certain number time-wise and they don't have any more time. So more does doesn't equal anything. As far as them just staying out, it's not like they breed 10 because you have more does. They just simply don't have the time during the rut when that, those does are coming into estrus. Number eight, very low percentage of areas have lots of both. That's what I talked about. You have those ag areas where there's low amount of cover and you have the one cover piece surrounded by a lot of ag. Well, you can stick a whole bunch of deer with both sexes in that location. Those are easy to manage. That's a little bit different story. Or you find those municipalities, a whole lot of deer that don't allow hunting. You hunt right next door on some public land. You're going to probably see a lot of does and fawns and bucks because they don't have any other choice. They're there. That's the one spot they can feel safe. So very low percentage of areas have lots of bucks and lots of does just naturally. Number nine, I talk about that balance. So critical you have that balance. The more does you have after a certain point, the fewer bucks you will have on the land. There's just for all these reasons. They don't want to live with all those does, not to mention the does eat everything out of house and home. They take up space. Waste the resources, not only the resources that you spend, but the resources the bucks want to consume on the land. Number 10, easy to control. Too many does. You have a choice right now. Can change your hunting habitats. You can limit or reduce or just eliminate summer food sources. You can create better fall habitat. Trigger control is the last step in eliminating does. First step, get rid of the summer food. You'll find you have fewer does that fall right off the bat. Work on your bedding cover. Create more layers. Create more bedding opportunity. If you have open hardwoods, it doesn't support a lot of deer. If you make clear-cut pockets within those woods, change the diversity of the woods. Create hardwood regeneration. Put shrubs in. Allow briars to come in. Plant some conifers. You start creating lines of habitat and edge. The more edge you have in your property, we talk about that good wildlife properties will have 10 to 20 times more edge than their surrounding border. That means on a 40 acre parcel, you have that surrounding edge, 440 yards by 440 yards. That's 440, 440, 440, I add it up. Just quick in my head, I believe that's 1,720 yards. So on the inside, if you have food plot space, if you have bedding cuttings, pockets, if you have travel corridors built in, another food plot over here, you add up that edge, that edge should be many times more 
than the circumference of the parcel. That tells you because of edge. Whitetails are creatures of edge, but it's not all about whitetails. It's wildlife too. White wildlife are creatures of edge. Rabbits, pheasants, you need pollinators for birds, butterflies, bees. You need edge, hardwood regeneration for turkeys. You need hardwood mature stands for turkeys, roosting trees. You need open fields. It all goes together, wildlife in general. You have too many does in your land, it eats the resources for everything involved. Not to mention, it eats the resources that you're spending to create a great hunt in the fall. And a herd full of does on your land is a bad herd. When you have a bad herd, you will have a bad hunt. When you have a great herd that has balance, you're gonna find your optimum number and the highest potential of bucks on your land, including those older bucks, you're going to have a great hunt. But too many does throws a wrench into everything, takes up space, eats your resources. It's a sign of bad hunting, sloppy hunting, bad habitat. And don't ever be fooled that more does is a good thing. You want that balance. You wanna hit your optimum number which varies greatly. So I'm not gonna even throw numbers out there as for per 40 or per 100 acres. I can tell you though, that a 30 acre parcel, 20, 40, 60, that parcel alone, because mature bucks only move two to 400 yards on average during the daylight, not at night, they have a three mile home range, but a 40 acre parcel is only 440 yards wide. But that encompasses half sometimes the movement of a mature buck or double the amount of movement of a mature buck during any given daylight period, the majority of the season. So when you think in those terms, it doesn't take a lot to be a herd influencer. And if you're the one holding all the does, rest assured someone else in the neighborhood is the herd influencer. And again, it's easy to produce a lot of does on private land. So don't pat yourself on the back if you have a lot of deer, but you don't have the majority of the older bucks focused on your land during the daylight because that is the trick folks. That's what tells everybody around you that you're doing a great job, not just because you have fields of green full of velvet bucks and a bunch of does and fawns on your land during the summertime, because that tells everyone in the area that knows something, that really knows what they're doing, that there's something bad going on in that property. I want you to have good property. I want you to have a herd influencer. I want you, if you're a herd influencer, you're that top 5% of all whitetail parcels, top 3%, then you're not only going to have a great herd going into this year that limits the amount, of, uh, the amount of does and fawns you have on your land, but you're going to have an exceptional hunt because you can't have one without the other. Now I'm excited again this year to host our Camp Kicking Bear charity event. Last year we did it in June and it was a big success. We were able to raise over 21,000 for Camp Kicking Bear. There's some people that actually make comments that they get sick of hearing about this kind of stuff and whatever else. I think they didn't understand that we're actually raising money. This Camp Kicking Bear is to me the number one children's organization that gets kids in the outdoors, their families, especially a lot of kids that don't have the opportunity to do so otherwise. June 11th, we'll, I'll have more details coming out about this, but you can email us for early registration. June 11th, it'd be midday, you know, like 11 to four type thing, 10 to five, 10 to four. What I do is there's 50 people that register for this. We give that all to Camp Kicking Bear. Well, it's a habitat day. We go out for a couple hours on the property and I show you some strategies that you can take home to your own land. Number three, we have a hunt raffle for 100 people. The, the registration for 50 people is $300. That gets you in the door to actually see the property and the land. $100 gets you in a hunt raffle times 100 people. We had uh, Leo from Lower Michigan had a uh, hunt last year, many memories, uh, end of uh, September for a couple days. Number four, Lots of door prizes, Matthews bows, blinds. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that uh, we give away, really good stuff for you too. Kids are free. I think we had about 25, 30 kids last year. All proceeds, again, go to Kicking Bear. Every dollar, every dime we raise goes to Kicking Bear. We'll have some other auction. Last year, Chris B came. We might have Kevin Smith, retired Major League Baseball player. I hear that Gary Suter, he's a NHL Hall of Famer. He might show up too. So. There's some chance to meet there. And then, of course, Ray Howell. He was here last year. He delivered his testimony. It was an awesome, inspirational talk that he gave to everyone. Hope to see you there. Look for further details on the site and then the description for the video.